chapter 5. chapter 5, we're going to read uh, the first four verses of Daniel chapter 5. It says, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to thousands of his lords, and drank wine before the thousands. And Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, demanded to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his princes and wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes and wives and concubines drank in them. And they drank wine and praised the gods of gold, of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. Our Heavenly Father, we just come to you again in prayer. We thank you for uh, the things you've done for us this day. We just uh, thank you for allowing us to have the opportunity and privilege to be in your house. And we just Thank you for the help that you've given us, that we're able to be here. We pray for all prayer requests we've had, especially for the families that have lost loved ones. We just pray that you would be with these families in, the, in this time of a heartache trial, and that you would uh, comfort them and strengthen them and draw them close. And we pray that uh, maybe even through these, that if, uh, if some of the family members are not born again, that they would turn and accept you as Savior. We just pray for all the sicknesses that we've heard. And, unspoken request, special prayer request. We just pray that you have your way and will on each of these. And for our missionaries around the world, we pray that you would uh, uh, be with our church here as uh, the preacher's away for a few weeks. And we just pray that you would uh, be with each one of us as we try to uh, do more to take up the slack. And we just pray that you would uh, be with the church to help it continue to grow. And that we would uh, do the things that you would have us to do. And we just pray for the message tonight that your spirit would be here and well and work in each of our lives and it be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A lot of times in our personal lives or are in our nation's lives or in our church lives or however you want to put it, a lot of times we come to a point in our life where we see the writing on the wall about what's going to happen. And in this story here we find that this king, as we're going to look at, comes to a place where he's going to see the writing from God on the wall. You know, God tries to tell individuals things. He tries to tell countries things. He tries to tell churches things. And he uses uh, many different ways, a lot of certain different circumstances, different problems, different uh, difficulties, trials. He uses his word. And uh, he uses many different ways to get our attention and, and to see if we're listening and to make us listen. And uh, we're going to find, I think, that this is a real interesting story. And, I, and hopefully uh, you've all read it numerous times. And if not, we're getting close to the beginning of the year. And we'll have Bible le uh, reading schedules. And everybody needs to take one. And then at the end of next year, you will have read this. But um, we're just going to look through the writings on the wall. For this story here, we've got to take a trip. And we're going to go to ancient Babylon. We find that... Um, it's um, on the banks of the Euphrates River. We heard a lot about that area during uh, Desert Storm. The part that we want to look at is about 50 miles south of what would be Baghdad and Iraq. We find that um, back in the ancient times, Babylon was the party capital of the world. And I think uh, America is heading towards that now. There's probably a few countries that are still doing a little better than us. But this was the party capital of the world at this time. Babylon had the Hanging Gardens, which everybody's heard about. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, which is uh, Belshazzar's grandfather, he had had the Hanging Gardens made for one of his wives. It was one of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world. <coughs> we find that uh, Babylon here, um, if I'm getting this guy's name right, is Herodotus. He was a Greek historian. He called it the City of Gold. And we know that the true City of Gold is heaven. That's the City of Gold Amen. we're looking for. But in ancient times, the city of gold was Babylon. In the midst of this city, though, 
It was filled with greed. It was filled with gold. It was filled with ghouls. It was filled with uh, Belshazzar. He reigned at this time. He was a uh, proud king and a profane king. Uh, you'd have to try, travel many, many miles to find another king that was immor as immoral as he was. And we find his father, you find his father when you, when you read through here, his father had his low moments and he had his high moments. We find that he uh, lived in sin. We find that uh, the Lord punished him. It's one of the other stories in here you read. You find he got right with the Lord. But we find that the way that he had raised his son in his earlier years, you know, maybe the father found the Lord at the end, but we don't, but, you know, he has to pay, or his son is paying for the way he was raised to begin with. You know, a lot of times, you know, that's in each one of our lives. We need to remember that as we raise our kids and from the time we're little to the time we're old, that if we mess up parts of their life, and maybe we'll get right with the Lord, but, you know, that doesn't mean the kids are coming Amen. back. We all know, and remember the story of Abraham, how he took his nephew, and he went into the world, and Abraham got right, but we all find and remember the story of Lot and how far down he fell and how um, miserable and messed up his life was and how all of his uh, children, his son and daughter-in-laws and his wife all died in, in sin and in, uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah. So we find that here. We find that um, this king was a very immoral king. In verse 5, we read, uh, let's read the first four verses again. Let me make sure we, we get all these. It says, The Belshazzar the king made a feast to thousands of his lords, and drank wine before the thousands. And Belshazzar's while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring gold and silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken of the temple of the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king, his princes, and his wives, and his concubines drank in him, and they drank wine, and he praised the gods of gold, and of silver, and of brass, and of iron, and of wood, and of stone. And then the fifth verse, and in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand, and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. You know, in the same hour, in the same hour that all this partying was going on, the party capital of the world, it says the same hour that God's hand come and wrote upon the wall. You know, God knows just the right time to do what He does. Amen. He knows just the right time to come upon the scene. You know, nobody ever needs to wake God up. Nobody ever needs to inform God of what's hey. going on. Hey. We don't ever, uh, you know, God doesn't need any reminders. He knows. And he comes upon the scene at the right time. A lot of times he doesn't come upon the scene when we think he should come upon the scene. A lot of times he comes up later. A lot of times he comes up sooner. But God always comes up at the right time. And we find it here in the same hour. You know, just when he needed to. In the same hour, um, you know, at this time, Belshazzar, you read through there, he probably felt pretty secure in his lifestyle. I mean, he had to have because he was throwing uh, one well of a part. If you were unsure and your life was not going great, you probably wouldn't be thrown apart. You know, most of the time, that's when we cancel a party, when things are going bad. So he's pretty secure in his life. Things are going uh, great. Uh, but before the night's over, we're going to find that his sins are going to be written on the wall. His sins are going to be brought to his attention. You know, um, his sins are going to be written on the wall by God. You know, God wrote us a book that brings our sins to our attention. Now, he wrote this king's sins on the wall and bring them to his attention. That's the reason a lot of people don't like to read the Bibles. Because God has written us a book that brings our sins to our attention. We find that here. We find before this celebration's over, we find that this king's going to call for a preacher. You know, it's, uh, it's funny the times people call for the preacher. You know, he, evidently the preacher's not going to be invited to his party. And it's a good thing, as we're going to see later, that the prophet Daniel, it's a good thing he wasn't at this party. And, uh, you know, if he was at this party, he probably wouldn't did any good to call him. No, no. Maybe there's something else we should see. Make sure we don't go to the wrong places at the wrong, at the wrong times. And we find that the man of God wasn't there. And later on, they're going to need him. They're going to call for him. Now, let's look at Babylon again. This is a, a no average city. This uh, city was the, a center of the heart and a... Uh, agriculture at this time. Um, it was uh, full of all kind of architecture. Um, it was a, a city of books, a city of learning, but at the same time it was a city of uh, lust and um, 
a city of uh, degradation, a city of evil. You know, it always seems that the, that the, the more learned and the more knowledge that we have in society, the farther we go away from God. And, and we have our, our country to look at there, too. You know, you go back 200 years ago, and we didn't have any of the knowledge that we have now. You go back 50 years ago, we don't have the knowledge that we have now. But we have one thing, people trust in God a little bit more. And then the more we learn, the farther away from God we go. You know, this city was as far away from God as you could go, but this city was the most educated and the, and the greatest city at that time. The outer walls of this city were 15 miles square. The outer walls were 350 feet high, 750 feet thick at the bottom. They were 300 feet wide at the top, and they could roll uh, six chariots across around the city at the same time on the outer wall. We find that the inner wall was 250 feet high, and that's where they had their garrisons of soldiers, and they poured the oil over the enemies if they somehow or another managed to get through the first wall. You know, a great city. You find that it was a city of worship, as we saw there. In verse 4, it says, They drank wine, and they praised the gods of gold, and of silver, and of brass, and iron, and wood, and of stone. It was a city of worship, a city of religion, but it was a city of pagan worship. A city of pagan religion. It wasn't a city that worshipped God. It was a city that worshipped many different gods. We find that the chief attraction at this uh, city was the palace of Belshazzar here. Uh, when I was uh, studying and reading up, finding all this stuff, I thought it was interesting. That's what I'm telling you. The uh, dining room in this palace was uh, 1,650 feet wide and one mile long. You know, if you sat at the end of the table, you could starve to death before you made it to the end. <laughs> we find that the central table, it says, could accommodate 1,000 men, their wives, and their concubines. As we find here listed, they were bringing, you can see the 1,000 people at this table, at the central part of this table. You know, people think, they, you know, all the preachers talking about mom's table. It was nothing compared to this. We find that, uh, when I was reading, they said that they had trained peacocks. They had uh, golden harnesses. And they pulled golden carts up and down the table full of the meats and wines for all the guests to set at this table. And the peacocks would drag the carts by and you would take your food out of it. You know, a city, of, a city and a king of uh, pride and pleasures. You know, and that's what they looked at. They, they had an, uh, it says that they had an orchestra of around 32,000 players that played music during the dinner. You know, ancient Babylon, you know, what a night they were. What a celebration they were having. What a city they were having. They were having. <coughs> you know, in the middle of the dancing, in the middle of the dining, in the middle of the degradation, appeared an uninvited and unwelcome guest. And that guest was God. You know, sometimes God comes on the scene when we're having our own little parties and we're having our own little times, and God breaks in and reminds us of what we ought to be. That's right. You know, at a time when they were feasting and celebrating and looking at the things of the, of the devil and of the world, God invited himself. We find at the party, it says in uh, verse 5, which we read, it says, uh, uh, came the fingers of a man, and, and it wrote, and, and it wrote something on the wall. You know, three things happen. We want to look at three things here. We find that um, of the writings, what the writings were, there's three things. And, and it's first well, let me put it this way. There's some desecration of holy things that are going on at this party that the writing brought about. I about in the first four verses, or look at the verse one again. It says, The king made a great feast of thousands of lords and drank wine before the thousands. And the first thing we have, first desecration we have, is that uh, it says they, they drank wine before the thousands. It's first one. You know, a few drinks really makes a person think there's something or somebody. You know, this king, he ought and a few drinks made him go more and more and more. We find that um, you know we shouldn't pattern our lives after him. He was the king. He had everything. Everything that anybody at this time could want, he had. People probably um, looked up to him and, and wanted to, to be like him. You know, we shouldn't look up to people like that. You know, uh, uh, when, when people drink, we know that they do a lot of uh, stupid things, a lot of wild things, and as we find here, a lot of simple things. We find that you know, we've all seen examples of that. People that are drinking and acting crazy. 
And you know, we find there's no courage in a bottle, we're told. You know, a lot of times uh, teenagers look up to the, the guys and the gals and the crowds and do the drinking. You know, a lot of times they seem to be the cool crowd or the in crowd, but the Bible says that they're the foolish crowd, and the Bible calls them fools. You know, the, the first sin here is the sin of non-temperance, the sin of strong dink, drink, dink, the sin of strong drink. You know, the sin that man commits against himself here. That's the first sin we find. Man commits the sin against himself. In uh, Proverbs 20, verse 1, it warns, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Look in uh, Proverbs 23. Turn it. It's Wednesday night. I better at least go there for a couple verses. Make that. Proverbs 23, verse 29 through 35. And, and you've all heard these verses numerous times, but you can never read the Bible too much. It says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contention, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth color in the cup, when it moveth itself right, lest at the last it biteth like a serpent, stingeth like an otter, thine eyes behold strange women, thine heart shall utter perverse things, yea, thou shalt be... As he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of the mast, they have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick, and they have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Amen. Now, man can't drink this one drink. That's right. And we have 50,000 deaths annually in this company, that, company in this country that attest to that. 50,000 people die in this country a year because of alcohol. You know, uh, alcohol poisons the mind, poisons the body, poisons the soul. Right. It destroys people. It's the number one drug in our country. Right. All you ever hear is kids, parents don't want their kids to drink. And we got D.A.R.E. programs in this, or don't want their kids to take drugs. And we got D.A.R.E. programs in the school, don't do drugs, don't do drugs. But then the parents stay home and drink. Yep. And That's right. the problem with the kids drinking, and it's crazy. And we find it was going on here. Second sin we find going on there is the sin of immorality. You know, uh, this is a sin against our fellow man. You know, how many homes are broken because of immoral behavior? How many children's lives are ruined because of immoral behavior of their parents? In uh, back in uh, chapter 5, verse 2, Daniel says, Thou shalt have while he tasteth the wine, commanded to bring the gold and silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple that was in Jerusalem, and the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. You know, he gives a description here about the wine, the king, his princes, the wives, his concubines. You know, we can imagine the immorality that was going to go on there. I want to read you back in Proverbs 23, where we, are, where we were, verse 33. It says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. You know, the verse describing alcohol says that it leads to immorality. Yeah. And then we find it here. You know, there's a, I didn't write them all down, but there's a, at least, I, I know of at least three verses that specifically state that alcohol leads to immorality in the Bible. And, and, and we know it's true. You know, when do uh, most uh, people, uh, girls, you find girls that always get a day break and stuff. When? When they're out drinking. That's right. Somebody, me and my wife, knows. She went out drinking, went out, and, you know, and got messed up. I and mean, it happens to lots of people because alcohol tears down your defense system. You can't protect yourself. You don't even know what you're doing. Right. And you wake up, and we find it here. We find it, it goes on every night in our country. And it was going on at this part. We find third was the sin of infidelity. You know, the, the desecration <laughs> of holy vessels of God. We find that in these verses. First, we had a sin of temperance. Which was uh, man's sin against himself, then the sin of immorality, man's sin against others, and then the sin of infidelity, man's sin against God. You know the desecration of vessels that God had declared holy. Hmm. You know they.